I was walking back from dinner with my wife last night and we were talking about things and all the lessons we'd learned over life and I just said what I'm sure a lot of people think is now that I actually know something, it's a shame I have so little time left. Uh, hi, everybody. Right. I'm Bill Whittle here with Steve Green and Scott Ott, and this is your um, Right Angle Show. And today we're going to deal with something that I saw just this morning. Last night I was saying it'd be nice now that I've learned some things if I had a little more time. Well, maybe I will. Uh, there's been an ongoing uh, series of researches uh, going. Researches? There's been a lot of research on aging, and apparently, they have actually found a way to make, they've done it in a lab, made a cell actually grow younger, grow less damaged, less uh, less uh, susceptible to corruption and so on. So uh, today I want to talk about immortality and what you would do with it and what it might do to society. Uh, the short form on aging appears to be that um, on the genes there are these things on the ends called alleles and these things get shorter and shorter, but basically the net effect is this. You, you begin to get copying errors, and the copying errors begin to multiply. And a great, great, great way to think of this is if I had a, uh, just say you typed out the Constitution on a sheet of paper, uh, printed it out in Microsoft Word, and then you put it in a photocopy machine, you made a copy. That copy would be very good. But then if you went in, you, you went and made a copy of the copy, and then you made a copy of that copy, and the little errors begin to get bigger and bigger and bigger until after six, seven, eight generations, you just got a blob because there's always some kind of errors. And that's basically what's what causes aging. The, the cells don't reproduce as accurately as they should, and and off we go. Uh, Steve, let's start with you. You know, we're both uh, science fiction fans yeah. and, and High Line fans and, you know, I Stranger was, in a Strange Land. I was going to talk about I, I that, just, yeah. I'm just teeing you up. <laughs> um, it. There, it seems to me that all of these... Um, all of these uh, stories that deal with immortality seem to have embedded in them a sense that the immortal people have reached a point where they're not only ready to die, they want to die. Yeah. They, 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 they've just lived enough. Um, what do you think about that idea? Because it's not a question of living 200 years as a 95-year-old man. It's a question of living 200 years as a 25-year-old man. Yeah, in, uh, in Robert Heinlein's uh, Lazarus Long books, Woodrow Wilson Smith, a.k.a. Lazarus Long, and all of his other many names. He could have a, a, a Johnny Fever coffee mug 20 feet tall with all of his names on it, if anybody else remembers that reference. Uh, by the time he reached about 3,000 years old in the books, he had had it. He set himself out to die in a flop house before his friends and family rescued him and, and through various means, gave him his, his will back, not just to live, but to want to live forever. I don't know if any of us have that. But I think the most important lesson I got from reading Heinlein's Lazarus Long stories isn't the idea of immortality, which, you know, actually, let me take a quick sidebar here, because we're approaching it kind of the other direction. In the books, the original long-lived people had sort of won this genetic lottery, and when the re right. yeah, when the rest of humanity found out their big secret, uh, embarked on sort of a longevity Apollo project, you know, a crash project to make people live much longer, and they ended up having quite a bit of success with that. Where ordinary people who weren't genetic lottery winners were living to be 200, 300 years old through through medical means, and we are approaching it that way first. Maybe not with a crash program, but we've got all these scientists working very hard at figuring out what makes us age, as you just said, and of course the next step is to figure out how to prevent that, and I hope in my case, since uh, we're all getting, or in our cases, since we're all getting older, how to reverse that. If I could just put 37 to 43 on an infinite loop, I think maybe I would have that will to live for, for 3,000 years. But the most important thing I get from all of this talk about longevity, whether it's Heinlein or, or us here, is something Dora said in Time Enough for Love. And that is, we all have the same amount of time here on Earth, if you really think about it. There's a time when we're here, and there's a much vaster time of sp span of time when we aren't. And what counts is, whether it's, whether it's 25 years like we had in the past, or whether it's 80 to, to 100 years like we have now, or whether it's 3,000 years sometime in the future, is how do you spend that time and how do you treat the people you know? Uh, Scott, that's, that's lovely, Steve. Scott, let's uh, go to you um, for some, uh, I don't want to say moral or ethical questions, but what I really mean by that is moral and ethical questions. Um, <laughs> what 
there is a there is a a I think an unavoidable scent of decay about the idea of a human being living for a long time, even if they were perfectly healthy. There seems something wrong with it, something <laughs> immoral, uh, something really quite um, unpleasant. Where do you think that comes from? Human nature. I mean, I think we know <laughs> ourselves. I think. We, we, you know, part of me says, yeah, yeah, I'd like to live a long, long time, see my grandchildren's grandchildren. Boy, what a, how spectacular would that be? On the other hand, I think, you know what, I've already piled up quite a record of crime uh, in this <laughs> single lifetime. Imagine how much harm I could do if given another several hundred years. <laughs> I mean, here's, <laughs> let, me, let me give you an example of human nature. Bill, when you were talking about that, how we may be able to live for maybe hundreds or, or thousands of years, my thir first thought was, um, make sure today that you pick up your 600-year subscription at BillWhittle.com. <laughs> yeah. Just one Bill, payment. Yeah, there's a little <laughs> asterisk next to the lifetime membership thing. You should look into that and, and uh, just That's read the right. fine print there. Your, your check will be cashed immediately. The benefits may not subsist as long as we have predicted. Um, you know, and then when you were talking about that great analogy of a of a printer, you know, of a copy machine making a copy of the Constitution or the Declaration or whatever, and then the next copy. But I think you need to, to make that even better, like to show how what really happens, because we take the toner cartridge out and we strap onto it a goiter and we give it a hernia. And then, <laughs> you know, we, uh, we have it, uh, we pour some alcohol into it and then, then we stuff it full of other junk that it shouldn't have. And then we continue to make copies. Um, my concern immediately when you brought up this topic is, given enough life, will we develop enough wisdom? And, uh, wow. you know, I think of if you read the Old Testament, you'll find that the lifespan of humans declined rapidly after we started clustering up in, in con uh, large concentrations. And Noah, who, you know, ha or not Noah, um, yeah, Noah, who has this great reputation as the guy who built the ark that saved humanity at the instructions of God, later on, like, got wasted and passed out in his tent and his sons saw him laying around naked. You know, it's like, <laughs> so, you know, and he was hundreds of years old at that point. So you're just thinking, you, if, I, if I knew that I would be better at 275 than I am at 57, uh, then yeah, I'm not confident in that. Um, I think really that's it. I mean, it's one of the oldest saws in the world, but it's also the truest. And, and the older you get, the truer it becomes. You know, youth is wasted on the young. Um, the, 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 the potential that we have as, as adults and, and as we mature and as we gain in wisdom, not only would it be nice to have more time to do the things that we are beginning to find ourselves capable of doing, but it'd be nice to go and do the things that you do with a 25-year-old body and, and have some wisdom and some perspective and some, and some deep insights into things. Um, I was asked once on an interview show uh, why Republicans generally were so old. And I said, well, because it takes a while for life to beat the stupid out of you. <laughs> and, and, and that's basically the, the thing that I find distressing. Um, not, not, I've never really, as an adult, I've never had a big fear of dying. I've always tried to I've always thought to myself, it's an amazing life you've led already. It's unbelievable what you've done, um, and, and that's okay. But as a guy who got married finally at, you know, 57, um, we're, we're, we're looking at, you know, perhaps buying a house someplace, not in California, where you can actually buy a house. And now I'm doing the calculations, you know. It's like a 30-year mortgage. I'm, next year, I'm gonna, you know, April, I'm going to be 60. Um, so there is a certain, certainly a quality of, of something desirable. Let me put it this way. My interest in immortality is that I am not running away from something. I'm running yes. towards something. And I think the people who are really the most in, endangered by this idea, people who are terrified of the idea of dying, is just death just absolutely, they cannot process it. Um, because I think that those people would do some extraordinarily desperate things if this becomes a... a of you know a button that you can actually push and and the final thought i have of course is um as anybody who's a member of billwoodle.com knows there's such a thing as there, there's real time and then there's bill time and bill time moves very slowly um because because bill has a, a a lot of stuff going on and i realize 
that I don't ever get anything done on time unless I have a deadline. Hmm. And there is right now for all of us a deadline. Yeah. And I suspect that without that, if I knew I had another 300 years to get this next project done, <laughs> I'd, be, I, I, I'd be like I would be uh, when I take my homework home on Friday night, right? It's like not my problem. It's yeah. not Saturday guy's problem. It's not Sunday morning guy's problem. Yes. Sunday night guy is the guy who's going to have to worry about this. And, um, and I suspect that if we lose that, we might find ourselves losing something very, very precious. Yeah. And the final thing I'll say about that is this. Um, I've had a couple of pets that I've been very, very, very close to. I spent a lot of my time by myself before I got married, and and when they and when they went, it just just took a big piece yeah. of my heart with me. But if they hadn't gone, I wouldn't have the the two uh, cats that I have today. I never would have met them, and and I'm I'm I love those animals very much too. So it's a complicated issue, and I often wish science would just realize how smart science is and how immune to philosophical inquiries about the rights and wrongs of things. Uh, but I didn't feel that way when I was a stupid kid. It's just <laughs> something I picked up along the way. Anyway, that'll do it for this episode of Right Angle, made possible by the lovely uh, people at BillWhittle.com. A small number of people make the show available to, to th literally, literally hundreds of people watch the show. And, um, <laughs> and we're very grateful for them at all times. And if you want to be one of those people, you can join us over at BillWhittle.com. That'll do it for this week of uh, Right Angle. Thanks very much for joining us. On behalf of Scott Ott and Steve Green, we'll see you next week.